Studying the Roman fighting style is no simple thing. It spans over a thousand years, to say nothing of the Byzantines. In the West, if you look at Rome's basic tactical framework in a general way, it can be divided into three distinct systems. These systems have remarkably little to do with each other, and were constructed to accomplish three very different goals. It's actually astounding that they all belong to the same culture. Today, I want to talk about all three of these in turn. Let's get started. The phalanx system is the first one that Rome adopted. It came directly from Greece, as a result of early Greek influence on the Italian peninsula. A phalanx was a unit of tightly grouped armored spearmen, who moved and fought as one. There's a reason why the Greek fighting style was being appropriated by these foreigners. Phalanxes were tough, damned near invincible, actually. They were slow, but once they came into contact with the enemy, the combined weight of the entire unit was too much for anybody to handle, unless it was met with another phalanx. So the early Romans straight up stole this fighting technique. They used it with a lot of success against some of their neighbors who fought in a much less organized way. The standard way to array phalanxes was in one giant straight line. Any enemy charging into this would have been met with one giant wall of spears. The early battles would have been pretty lopsided, as the Romans just plowed over these undisciplined guys in loose formations. The only bad thing about phalanxes is that they were very slow, and had a hard time turning. Also, because of the way that everybody had to support the spearmen at the front, they couldn't fight in more than one direction at once. The more traditional way to counteract this was to put a lot of cavalry on the wings, to protect against any flanking attacks. They could also chase down any faster enemies that the phalanx couldn't catch. For whatever reason, the Romans never really did much of this, but they were successful all the same. This worked for a long time, but it started to get the Romans into trouble as they expanded into central Italy. This area was mountainous, which is not ideal for the slow moving straight lines of the phalanx. It's hard to keep a line like this perfectly straight as you move up a hill, for example. If you have to move around some rocky, impassable terrain, the entire line has to be broken up, which is the perfect time for an enemy to attack. Moreover, the inhabitants of this region were no slouches. They used hit and run tactics, and lots of projectile weapons. Even when they closed in for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, these were tough mountain men, and they gave the Romans a run for their money. The Romans suffered a string of defeats, and began to seriously reevaluate how they fought. Maniples were an ingenious solution to this very specific problem with the phalanx, inflexibility. First of all, maniples were smaller, standalone units. This meant that they were capable of fighting in isolation, or even in several directions at once. A phalanx would usually crumble if it ever got surrounded, whereas a maniple could shift and adapt. Second, they could move much more fluidly. Instead of arraying themselves in big, solid lines like the phalanx did, maniples arrayed themselves like this, in a checkerboard pattern. This was a fundamental change. Now they didn't have to step out of formation if they ever wanted to go over hilly terrain, or dodge trees and rocks, or cross a stream. The entire formation can kind of flex and bend as necessary, while maintaining its readiness. It wasn't just the formations that changed. Their entire fighting ethos was now different. The solid walls of spearmen were now mostly gone, replaced by men wielding swords and shields. Individual maniples now found themselves in specialized roles. There were three major ones. First, the Histadi. This is where the young and inexperienced men served. The Histadi were always placed at the front of the line, and were the first to come into contact with the enemy. Histadi were outfitted with a sword and shield, but also with javelins that the entire unit could throw at a moment's notice. This was a big innovation. The phalanx system had no ranged units, which meant that faster enemy units could stay at a distance if they wanted to. Now, not only were maniples faster, but almost every Roman unit was now a ranged unit. The Hestadi were always the first to close and make contact with the enemy. Then, after some time, an order would be given, and the Hestadi would swap out with the second line, who were called the Principe. These were older veterans, who were outfitted similarly to the Hestadi, but with slightly better equipment. Under normal circumstances, these two lines would alternate for the duration of the battle, giving each other a break as needed. In a perfect world, the third line would never be used. These were the Triarii, and they were the oldest veterans. We can think of them as their elite troops. Unlike the Histadi and the Principe, the Triarii retained some phalanx-like qualities. They were still spearmen, but were organized more loosely, so that the entire unit wouldn't crumble if they ever broke formation. The Triarii were so rarely used, that the Romans had a saying for when something was going badly. They would say, it's come to the Triarii. 
I've always liked this saying, because it has a meaning that's kind of unique to Roman culture. It means that the enemy has broken through and this is the last thing that we can do to respond. But it also means there's a major problem and it's time for the real adults to step in and fix this. It's weirdly pragmatic and optimistic. Sometimes an entire campaigning season would go by and the Triarii would only be used once or twice. This made them crazy. We're told that sometimes they were forced to sit on the ground during battle, like children, because they had this reputation for charging in against orders. They sometimes resorted to begging just to be allowed to get into the fight. I looked and looked and couldn't remember where I saw this, but years ago I read something saying that a Roman general put his Triarii up front during a battle because he was getting reports that there might be a mutiny if they had to sit this one out. That might be apocryphal, but I swear I saw it somewhere. These were tough dudes, and when they were finally unleashed, they fought like hell. Let's go back for a moment to the Battle of the Trebia River. If you recall, the first two Roman lines fully committed, and some in the center were in the process of cutting through the enemy and marching right off the battlefield. These were the Hastati and the Principe. The third line, the Triarii, were held back as usual. When Hannibal's epic surprise attack emerged from the long grass, the Triarii turned, fixed spears, and stopped the attack dead in its tracks. They did their job perfectly and didn't give an inch. It was the younger men up front who panicked and started to give in to the Carthaginians on the wings. These same Triarii were the ones who were last seen getting surrounded, holding their ground and making a heroic last stand as the rest of the Romans were killed, captured, or driven off. I'll say it again, these were tough dudes. Rome used this maniple system for a long time, and Rome eventually rose from being a regional to a global power. But as this was happening, they started to notice some structural issues. The maniple was designed to face off against the hill people in central Italy, and now Romans were fighting from Spain to Asia. A lot of the time, they were now in the position of fighting huge, well-organized armies from rich and powerful kingdoms. Things had changed, and Rome needed to reorganize. The solution that they came up with is called the cohort system. Before any major changes were made, one thing was abundantly clear. Rome needed bigger units. The maniples were just too damn small now. Against the hill people of central Italy, one maniple here and one maniple there could make all the difference in the world. But now, armies were huge, and a single maniple here or there was kind of irrelevant. As the first thing going into this reform, the size of each unit was quadrupled. Armies went from having 40 maniples to having 10 cohorts. But a cohort wasn't just a giant maniple. They also fundamentally changed how these units operated. The different experience levels and different specializations were completely done away with, and each cohort became more or less identical. The big strategic change that this facilitated was that the army now emphasized mobility. Unlike the maniple system, these soldiers carried around their own gear, set up their own camps, and cooked their own meals. These guys could construct bridges, clear forests, build roads, I mean, anything. These new units were designed to be entirely self-sufficient. They needed to be able to ditch their supplies and march off at a moment's notice if they needed to. And they often did. You can see the appeal of this kind of army. When you have guys stationed thousands of kilometers from the capital, in sometimes hostile territory, you don't necessarily want a bunch of specialists. In other words, you don't want to risk having the backbone of your army wiped out during a battle when reinforcements are months away. You want the entire army to be your backbone, if that makes any sense. There were new tactical realities that emerged naturally from this new organizational structure. With these larger cohorts, it was kind of like each army was made up of 10 smaller armies. This meant that the Romans could now do things differently on the battlefield. They could now delegate a lot more authority to sub-commanders who could use their own initiative. Under this new system, a general could say, take this cohort and hold the line over there and use your own judgment. It's important to emphasize that almost every cohort was identical, which was a radical change. It meant that any individual unit could step in for another one without any disruption. It also meant that if you wanted to supersize an army, all you had to do was add a few extra cohorts. There was never a situation where you'd be thinking, I have way too many Histadi and not enough Triarii. There was no such thing as a lopsided army. Every unit was the same and self-contained. So what did it mean that they used all of these different tactical structures? It's not like one was a natural consequence of the previous one. These were all radically different systems. The Romans were successful with all of them, but each accomplished very different things, so what gives? Above all, the Romans were pragmatic. 
when a thing stopped working, they ditched it, unsentimentally. They adopted the phalanx system to solve a very specific problem, which was that they had some powerful neighbors that already used the phalanx, which was at the time considered unstoppable. They adopted the maniple system to solve another very specific problem, which was that they needed to fight on uneven terrain and respond to hit and run attacks from creative, less organized enemies. The cohort system was adopted to solve yet another very specific problem, which was that they were now fighting larger, more traditional armies in remote, far-flung provinces. All of a sudden, Rome needed a large-scale, professional, standardized army, so they invented one. This constant tactical innovation allowed Rome to flourish for over a thousand years in the West. That's no small thing. This constant change also meant that, for them, failure was an option. Each time they were defeated in a major battle, they made significant changes to their military, and usually for the better. That's a cultural trait that's hard to teach, but it was probably Rome's greatest strength. This video topic was selected by a vote by the people over on my Patreon page. If you want to participate in the vote for another video like this, you can do that right now. You can just click the link in the description. The voting is going on as we speak.